big welcome to Patrick, uh, Olivia. We've um, we communicated in, uh, over Skype and uh, uh, emails. Very pleased to welcome you and uh, Manika. So hi, yeah. it's an old wolfish friend. Exactly. Uh, yeah. To, to join us for a couple of days, and uh, Manika is starting a PhD in Bangladesh on uh, behavior change communication in. Uh, and nutrition, so very close ties with Shakuntala, okay. under Patrick. Yeah. And when we had the first call with Patrick, we were fascinated to learn about this whole area of digital civics. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? What does it mean? But it, it really sounded very interesting, very relevant to achieving uh, some of the goals of the organization. So Let's really hope so. pleased to have you Great. here to learn more about it, and hopefully based on, on the next couple of days, identify some areas where we can work closely together yeah. to Brilliant. move forward. So Thanks. Big okay. welcome again. Over to you for the talk. Patrick. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks for that. That's, and it's exactly as uh, Mike says, this is really my visit here with Monika is a sort of get to know each other visit with a view to thinking about how we might do some work in future. I didn't n even know World Fish existed, I should say, before I met Monika and she told me about her experiences and her work there before. So really exciting um, to be here. And I'm actually here really because I've also moved to Monash University. I'm new there from as of Christmas. Um, but this digital civics agenda is an agenda I've been developing over the past, well, probably about five years. And I'm going to give the presentation, I'm going to talk about this really in a sort of biographical sense, really about m my trajectory as a sort of researcher and hopefully not going into great technical details or even theoretical details about the work, but really presenting you with some of the sort of examples of how that view of we, how we use digital technology has changed. So I'm hoping this will give you some ideas. It's a great setup here. I thought I'd be sitting in a meeting with my laptop facing through, but I mean, it's a sort of full production environment, which is great. I was just saying to the guys earlier, you know, typical man, you know, middle-aged man, I sort of feel like Madonna, but I look like a fat Phil Collins. So, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> so I'm qu this, is quite, this is a good experience for me, actually. So, uh, so Monash is my new uh, home as an academic, but actually, I only moved there just before Christmas, and I came from a lab called Open Lab, at Newcastle University. So that's Newcastle University in the UK. Not particularly well-known university, but, but, but like a, a, a good quality university in the UK where I founded a lab actually called Open Lab. It was actually our second name. We used to be called Culture Lab. Um, and then we uh, have this name Open Lab. And it's a, what we work in is we, in this area of called human computer interaction. That's the field of computer science, which is around the area of people and technology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we move from that sort of computer science framing of human-computer interaction to this civics framing of human-computer action. And quite an influential group over the years. So we had two large initiatives. I don't know if you know, in the UK, um, there's big funding for digital economy research. So that's cross-disciplinary research around digital technologies involving social scientists, health, computer science design. And we had a big doctoral training center there, still running actually since I left, uh, with um, a cohort of 12 or 13 students a year coming in each year, a big digital economy research center with 24 postdocs, all co-located. So we're quite untypical. We're a very practice-based research group, everyone physically located in the same open plan space, including the academics and the students. So that's very much our sort of way of working. Um, and we were, imp we were influential you know, in, in our field. Um, academic, as I said, what we did is co-located, cross-disciplinary, and really configured for, I guess what you say is academic success, and sort of an, as an academic, your view of the world is actually sort of quite narrow, thinking about your publication. So if you take the leading venue for human-computer interaction, which is ACM, Human Factors in Computing, after Carnegie Mellon and Washington, who are sort of huge universities, we had like the next most publications in the last five years. So that's pretty good for somewhere like Newcastle. Um, but actually, what we've experienced is a, is a trajectory and change over time. And I'm going to walk you through that to this digital civics agenda. So I've sort of moved from that setting to one that's a bit different, 
we've actually got a name for our lab that we've coming up with called we're calling it Action Lab. I should say at Newcastle we started off calling ourselves Culture Lab, then it's Open Lab, and then I sort of thinking let's forget all this subtlety and just talk about what we actually are going to be, which is Action Lab. So the academics hate it. Oh, you know, cheesy name Action Lab, but actually our collaborators really like it because where we have this sense of trying to configure ourselves not so much even as partners for our collaborators, but actually as capacity for our collaborators. Capacity to do things which you might not, might not do um, um, without, I without that partnership. So we're new, I've just been going a few months. We have a sort of considerable startup funding in terms of staff and students. So we're gonna be about 18 people by the end of the year. Um, we have an established collaboration with the Red Cross and the International Federation of the Red Cross and, and Red Crescent Societies, which we're continuing to do. And we're actually looking to build up our collaborations in this sort of more global applications of technology. But again, we're co-located all in a physical space, cross-disciplinary. And although we're still working in this field of human-computer interaction, we like to say we're configuring ourselves for impact. Um, and that means that really thinking about the difference between configuring yourself for academic success and for impact is really about your relationship with your partners. So we're looking to build long-term relationships with partners who, if work is successful, have that potential to scale out the sort of innovations that we're interested in. Feels all a bit abstract. Probably best to get on to what we're doing. So what do, what do researchers in human-computer interaction do? Well, they do the sort of thing that your average 14-year-old thinks people and technology mean, which is make widgets to go on your wrists and cool displays and new ways of interacting with technology and video. Um, this is the sort of area called interaction techniques and technologies. And we've done a lot of that sort of work. And quite influential. This stuff at the top right is a band you put around your wrist and it lets it work as a data glove. It was... It was a front cover of the MIT Technology Review by a really clever researcher called David Kim. We also do some sort of very techy stuff, which is quite topical these days, um, around machine learning and what's called ubiquitous computing, which is this idea of sensors and technologies embedded in the world. And thinking of food, actually, some of our well-known systems came out of that. This ambient kitchen was a kitchen environment with embedded sensors that could track your food preparation activities. You know, it's not really going to have an impact on world, uh, uh, on uh, 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 the diet of the world, but, but certainly people are interested in this. We actually were building it for things like situated support for people with dementia. So use it building sen developing sensors, using machine learning technology, that's still very much in the human-computer interaction field. And probably more down the softer end, something that we're very well known for at Open Lab and are bringing to our new lab, is this idea of design methods. So this idea of how do we engage users, which is computer science shorthand for people, in case you don't know. So how do we engage people in designing for uh, um, issues and engaging, designing for issues and getting at the lived experience of those issues. So when we're thinking of designing around older users or users, uh, use, uh, people with dementia and their carers or people in typical situations that but actually not typical for the design teams, we need to develop methods so that the de designers can genuinely empathize with, with um, the users in those situations and actually ones that give the people we're designing for a voice in that design process. So that's our sort of participatory and experience-centered design. So fine, we did this for five, six years, had a lot of academic impact in our field. But actually, what happened is when I was at Newcastle, we, had a, we got a new vice chancellor. Something like 10, 11 years ago, it was a guy called Chris Brink. He'd come from um, Stellenbosch. He was actually the vice chancellor at Stellenbosch at the time when they were integrating black students into what was a very traditional white university. So UK politics don't really quite compare with a situation like that. And he came with a vision around the role of the university in society and talked about societal challenges. Everyone talks about them now at universities, of course, but he talked about this idea of a civic university. And 
it's interesting, a lot of academics, are, at the time I remember talking to senior management, they were very sort of reluctant to talk about civic universities because it feels very parochial, you know, oh, it's about my local university and what they need to be is we need to be world class, you know, really interesting. And of course his vision wasn't civic doesn't mean world class, he means what is our university's role? What does it do in our community? What's its place around prosperity and well-being in, in society? And how can, we, how can we think about configuring ourselves to uh, contribute in that way? And at the same time, similar time, 2012, um, so this is far, you know, uh, three, uh, three years after we formally started the lab, about six years after we informally started it, this guy, Chris Chick, sent me hi. He was running the Civic Media Lab at MIT at the time, came and gave a talk at a conference we were running in Newcastle around designing interactive systems. And he had a really well-developed and interesting critique supported by work he'd done. I won't expand on it, but I sort of, I sort of uh, simplify it down to this idea of we need to stop thinking about users and start thinking about citizens. And when, I think when, in, when we think of s users in that computer science speak, it's really a shorthand for consumer, yeah? in the sense that it comes with a load of assumptions. Firstly, it comes with this assumption about the, uh, the fact that we engage with this sort of unsustainable progression of technology, yeah? this notion of sort of cons continuous consumption up the latest version of Android, the new iPhone, and what new services can we build that are driven by these. On the other hand, it also comes with some sort of very narrow understandings of what digital services mean. Neoliberal um, commercial models that are f have their place, obviously, in the world, but are not the full spectrum of what we might be able to realize with technologies. We think about designing for certain forms of consumption, but we don't th think about designing for neighbors, families even. Uh, communities and what the models need to be to be sustainable there. Families are a sort of great example where we completely understand the challenge of designing for a family. You know, give me an example of a really good family technology that anyone's built. There, is, there, there probably isn't anything in actual fact. So, so we're hitting this bar and we're thinking, oh, we want to be a civic university. We want to think about our role and how, how we support the community around us. We want to start thinking about citizens instead of consumers. And so our sort of, at that point, our vision, you know, vision sounds a bit grand, our sort of view is we looked around where, literally where we were in Newcastle. So we looked around at local government and communities and the sort of services um, that exist in that landscape. And they ranged really from areas where there's very large areas of expenditure like adult and child social care through to education. If you know anything about the UK, actually local government doesn't have a lot of say about education, but it's a big expenditure. Public health, of course, and then things like democratic services, so citizen participation in planning and decision making. Um, and that was a landscape we painted ourselves, that was a landscape we painted ourselves to, it, to engage with in through this program of digital civics supported by a lot of funding from the UK government in terms of the digital economy and new models for citizenship. So we think of digital civics as new models of participatory citizenship. Okay, so that means thinking about moving away from the sort of models of services um, which we might describe as transactional to what we think of as relational models. The sort of marketing people here, they have this sort of understanding about what we mean by relational. In very simple terms, we can think of a transactional service model as some data flowing from a citizen to the state or an NGO or um, uh, some third party, and a service, a decision about what service to be delivered is delivered back to you. Okay, so it's a straight, you know, needs service transaction. And when you think of digital in those terms, and a lot of organizations, and I know a lot of sort of charities and NGOs, as well as local government, when they think digital, all they think about is, oh, how can we reduce the cost of the transaction by using digital? We won't have a face-to-face -face interaction now. We'll have a portal that you go in and order your pension or get advice. Um, but when we think about relational, what we really mean is um, we're thinking about how can we think about services in terms of citizens, you service users sharing knowledge, sharing their experience, sharing their resources. And of course, to do that, thinking about building trust between citizens and those service users. 
So what, you know, that's a different notion of what a service might mean. And when we think of digital, we think about, well, how can we use digital to support sharing of knowledge, experience, build, uh, building a trust? Um, and so our challenge in digital civics is thinking about how do we address this issue and how do we think about design of relational models. Really simply, you can think, you could contrast something like a bus service with something like a lift share service, yeah? So a bus service is a transactional model of mobility, yeah? Because it has a timetable, there's a defined service, you interact with the bus at the bus stop according to that timetable. You think of something like a lift ser share service, you know, and I, I hes hesitate to say Uber because we don't think of Uber necessarily as a as a civic, uh, a, as a, a, a sort of positive civic agent, but actually, in some sense, you can think of it in this relational model as such. What Uber does is it thinks about who has mobility needs, who has mobility capacity, how can we broker those needs and capacity, how can we address the trust issues between that brokerage in terms of reviews and Transa financial transactions. That's the, that's the vision, of course. The reality is we know that if you give anyone less than a five out of five on your driver rating, you're basically threatening someone's livelihood. So it's not quite working out how it's meant to, but we can, we can imagine, we can see what the sort of rhetoric around sharing economy means in this sort of relational notion. Okay, so sounds sort of okay, feels a bit fuzzy, and I guess for, you know, if we're thinking in the sort of areas we work in, it's nice to start on some concrete examples. So really simple initial example, it was uh, 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 some work done by Madeleine Balaam and some PhDs and researchers, because an a, a open lab around breastfeeding. Okay, so uh, issue in the UK, uh, low rates of uptake of breastfeeding. In the north of England, it's even lower, in actual fact, where we're based. Um, so the issue was to think about, okay, how do we think about promotion of breastfeeding? And, and they ran a number of workshops with local women and found actually out through those workshops that one of the issues was access to places to breastfeed when you're not at home. Okay, so, uh, you know, the shops, the library, workplaces, not having the, the, uh, the facilities that are dedicated and not having the appropriate facilities at those locations. So we did a really simple thing. We actually built a location review system. Okay, so this is something we all have our experience of in everyday life. Mothers can re re create reviews of locations and share those locations through the app and through social media. Okay, so really simple idea. Of course, the traditional way of promoting breastfeeding in the UK, although it's changed of late, has been quite a transactional one. Your GP or your midwife sort of frightens you into breastfeeding because of the negative outcomes for you and your child at high school down the line, etc. So, but in this case, it's a very different model. We're basically framing the mothers as the experts and providing them with an infrastructure to share that knowledge and expertise. And it was a, just a bit of someone's PhD, but this is something that has over 10,000 users, um, deployed at the, in the UK. Interestingly, um, some you know, interesting academic outputs, out it, not just the design of it, but there's a nice BMJ Open paper talking about analyses of how women frame privacy, notions of privacy differently in different areas. You've not just got a location review app here in that sense. You've all, what you've got is a network of human capital with common interests around breastfeeding who would turn into a network of social capital around toddlers, for example. So in what it actually is, is a sort of an infrastructure for citizens to share their knowledge and experience. We still hit problems with this, trying to get local government to put it on their website, for example. Much as they support it and, and uh, uh, staff promote it, they have this anxiety around um, what if someone puts a bad review on it? which is sort of incredible, of course, but, but I think it sort of gives you that sense of how local governments, certainly in the UK, still frame themselves as the knowledge, the provider of trusted knowledge, rather than the provider of infra digital infrastructures that support knowledge sharing. Okay, S that's nice. It's a sort of nice example, but it's still too top-down. Although we did participatory design work with the mothers, um, and deployed the system, it's still us giving a system to mothers. And when you look at it, actually, this location review system could be more generic than this. You could be reviewing anything in there, couldn't you? Could be something else, could have different criteria. And the step on from that was to sort of generalize it. So 
generalize it to a system called app movement. So what app movement does is it lets anyone go on this website and propose a feed finder like system. So that was called feed finder, the breastfeeding one. So you come on here and I'll show you actually better to show you in an actual application. This is a live system. So you come on here and you'd say, okay, I want um, an app for where to find free condoms. So this is a sexual health charity in Newcastle that distribute it. This is a women's breastfeeding group in Lebanon who want their own feed finder application with different review criteria. Or uh, Volkswagen enthusiasts in Tatarstan, or, or where to fly your drone is a nice example. So where to fly your drone. So this guy, Simon Newton, he's got a little YouTube channel with some followers. He writes a couple of paragraphs about why we need a review app for places to fly your drones because they're worried about regulators banning drone flying if people are irresponsible, etc. People come on and support it. So they create an account, write a supportive comment. And when you get above a certain threshold of supporters, it then goes into the design phase. So you hit this threshold. It was just 50 supporters when this was deployed. And in the design phase, anyone who, s who supported it can propose a name for the app or the icon or a color scheme or the rating options. So if we look at the rating options, for example, there's scenic values, suitability for training. They vote for each other's ratings. And the nice thing is at the end of the week that it's in that design phase, the app is then automatically generated. So you're not paying some dis digital agency to 40 grand to, you know, to uh, build your app and then have to keep paying them to maintain it. It's automatically generated because essentially it's the f breastfeeding feed finder app with a different color scheme, a different name and some slightly different criteria for reviewing. Okay, so the difference here between the breastfeeding app, the feed finder app and app movement is app move feed finder was a information system for reviewing breastfeeding, framing the web women as experts and giving the opportunity to share. This is a system that is actually lets people commission their own service. Yeah, so that's a sort of step forward. Obviously a limited one around the sort of things we're talking about. And if we look at it, these are apps that have come through that process. There's one here about local photography spots. So that's just a, a Facebook photography group in Newcastle who want good places to take photographs. And if you can see, you know, there's a few thousand users, several hundred locations people have put reviews in of where to take photos. It's small scale, but of course it costs almost nothing to produce it. And if no one uses this app, it doesn't really matter. The other thing about this is because you source your audience first, your core audience, people who support the idea, you have the problem, the cold start problem you have with these review apps. So that problem of putting a review app out and having no reviews, the things sp companies spend millions on getting people to populate it with data, is sort of addressed in that. So what happens is we release the app and the people who have supported it are the first people who start populating it with reviews. So if we look at the drone zone ones, that's a nice example, probably the best one. That's, you know, 20,000 reviews, over 50,000 users. That's not just web clicks. That's people who've created an account and they downloaded the app and created an account. And who'd have thought, you know, we certainly didn't, that, you know, there is this sort of desire for where to fly your drone. And every Christmas, of course, it goes up several thousand. But, um, but this is not pushed by, there's no promotion by us at all. We do no promotion. The person who created it, he did a little thing on his YouTube channel, pushes it out and it's sustaining itself. So it's sort of interesting. Um, I'd argue it's sort of interesting. And interesting in that sense that here we're talking about a platform for commissioning data. So we can sort of elaborate on our interaction design methods, machine learning and ubiquitous computing design to these sort of things. So with our trajectory is we move to thinking, oh, actually, let's think about participatory platforms now. Yeah, stop thinking about like, individual applications. Platforms where we can aggregate effort, data collection, and sharing. And I'm moving to, I thought, I've, I thought although our thinking is sort of moving on from this as well now, and we, I have a numerous examples I can talk about, there are also some sort of general principles to our approach in this civics agenda. And they're, as you might imagine, it, they're participatory. We're thinking about ways, modes of participatory citizenship, through the creation of data or the sharing of the resources or support. The open refers to open technologies. So one of the things is everything we build is open source. 
Okay, so that means anyone can adopt it on a very permissive open source license. Companies can take it if they want. Um, other researchers can take it. We've, we're sort of committed to that principle and in innovation. And of course, we talk about place-based. So place-based is that idea that, you know, believe it or not, Airbnb isn't great for everywhere. And actually, we need to think about the, the local character of places. And if we're interested in governance models, designing in governance models, what's the appropriate model for locations? And you can think of FeedFinder, you know, it's place-based or the app movement in the sense that it's about location and about giving people the ability to share knowledge about location, but not place-based in the way that some of our other systems are. So this is an example. It's a system called Remix Portal. And w here we think about place-based in how do we develop approaches that are sort of ma optimal for that lo that 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 lo for a location. Okay, in that they sense. And when we think in education terms, we can think about. Edu educational approaches that use the assets. We talk about this sort of asset but approach to l learning. And this was an this is a project around music education where a PhD student was interested in music mixing, you mixing music, remixing music as a form of developing musical knowledge. And he has a, a whole pedagogy about how remixing music can support your learning about music. So the kids have a this is a little eight-track mixing desk that runs in a browser. They remix music. It can get more complex, the mixing desk, as their knowledge improves. They share those mixes with each other and can comment on it. But the really interesting thing is the music they're remixing is music from local musicians who they also share their music with. So what you find here is kids are doing some quite complicated activities around music mixing and understanding of music based on local musicians connected to through this. Therefore, the whole sort of framing of their learning activity is that music is something produced where I live. It's not just one direction in LA in some studio. So that's a really interesting sort of leap for them in terms of their, the sort of situated nature of their music and using the assets around them. And actually, on from this, another project. This is something um, done by Tom Bartendale, who's joined me now uh, at Monash as well, and uh, Rebecca Nicholson. It's a, a program... Pro Gig Academy, and this is actually a sort of step on from Remix Portal, where they're not just remixing music, we're thinking about 20, what we call 21st century skills, teamwork, design, meetings, cord collaboration, where a class actually, I in the course of a term, plans a music event and delivers it for a local band. So what they do is they actually use Basecamp, I don't know if you know what Basecamp is, you know, online, bit of a clumsy online project management tool. They use Basecamp, divide themselves up into teams, addressing things like the lighting, the promotion, the sound engineering, and over the course of a term, put on an event and actually sell tickets to that event where the school is hosting the, the, the gig for the local band. So it's a sort of fascinating project-based la learning where it's not just you're thinking, let's learn music in the context of the local musical scene, but how can the school be an, inf be an infrastructure for the local music scene? And I really think about this. If they've only run about five of these in the UK. We're looking to push it in Victoria. But when you think about sort of local music scenes and how different they are and how you can promote that, I can imagine being a, if I was one of the kids doing this, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing you'd remember for the rest of your life. You know, you put on a music event for a, for, for a band. It's so really nice, um, I'd say. And again, an example of a couple of platforms, reuse of a platform like Gig Academy or, or um, Remix Portal. But actually, the sort of trajectory we're hitting now is one where we're thinking platforms, participatory platforms, they sound great. But actually, this sort of platform thinking can be problematic, OK? Um, and the ways it can be pr problematic in is in terms of one sort of sustainability. You build a platform. Someone's got to maintain that platform technically and sort of administratively. Um, and also, when you're talking about a platform, you're asking people to not do something they're doing, they're using their phones for, using WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever, Facebook or whatever, and you're asking them to come into your platform and log in and do something. And I think we know from experience that's a lot to ask people to do. So maybe in things like the feed finder or the drone zones, there's a real driver for a very specific bit of information, and people are happy with this little information appliance for a little bit of information. But in general, this thing, thinking about platforms 
can be a big barrier to participation. So what we did, our sort of first move away from that was some work we did with the Red Cross last year and the year before, IFRC, where they had exactly this issue. What they wanted to do is they, want, they, they have their f future forecasting activity. So they've got to produce a new strategy for the Red Cross 2030 strategy. What are the challenges we're facing? Um, and they really wanted to engage young people. Obviously, in these sort of humanitarian organizations, youth, the voice of youth is important, but actually also very hard to access. So what we did is we designed a pr an approach which doesn't create a platform. So the normal thing for this is let's create a website. You can log in your website, put your views, and discuss your views with each other. And of course, nobody ever does it, you know. So we just used WhatsApp actually for this. So what happened is we uh, young people sign up through a, a little website we've got with their WhatsApp number. And what we do is as they come get sign up, so a volunteer at the Red Cross creates a WhatsApp group for four of them and puts them in this WhatsApp group and gives each one a role. So they could be the, um, they could be, oh, I've got a point here. Oh, well, that doesn't matter. Yeah, so it could be the environmental scientist, the technologist, the economic advisor, the cultural advisor. And what we do is we do an activity over 10 days where we give them three tasks to do over those 10 days. The first one's an easy task, come up with a name for your team. But halfway through, they have to come up with a newspaper front story for what the world's going to be like in 2030. And the final task is to come up with a video of a report back to the Secretary General of the Red Cross of um, a, a Red Cross initiative, Red Cross Red Crescent, in 2030. So what they're doing is they're WhatsApping away in the group with each other. And of course, as well as being in their little team, this is the orange dots here, they're also put, if you're the environmental scientist, you're put into a bigger WhatsApp group with 50 other environmental scientists. And every few days, you have a conference in WhatsApp, a short, a time-limited event where people will be asking around emoji voting or take a photo of a challenge and push it into that group and getting, getting pushed um, uh, uh, challenges and issues around in the envi environmental issues and the same for the technologists, the economic advisors, the cultural advisors. So this isn't just everyone's in a WhatsApp group and talking. This is a coordinated action, time limited, where people have roles. We're using group structure in ways where we're thinking we want to upskill people maybe in some groups to bring it back to their groups. And of course at the end of it, we have all the media they produce, which we pull out, externalize into a platform, a leaderboard in this case. Or, um, and we also have hundreds of thousands of lines of WhatsApp chat about what these young people are, are, are interested in talking about. So this was nice. We did a pilot, uh, we did a pilot um, uh, um, uh, deployment of this with a few hundred people. We did full deployment with just under 4,000 young people in Spanish and English and four different time zones turned around in six months from not even having the idea. But the point here is young people are interacting in a channel they're in already. The, these notions of giving them roles helps you frame what you're going to do in that group. And the media that comes out of it is, a lot of it's very powerful. I mean, some of the best stuff, we actually made a little fold-up newspaper and they distributed 4,000 copies at the... Uh, uh, General Assembly of the Red Cross last October. So in, nice and interesting. But the gen more general point is actually this idea of what we call unplatforming. Okay? So this coordinated action designed purposefully with a structure and roles um, to actually do some of the sort of activities you want. And we're very interested in taking this sort of unplatformed approach. You could say it's just using social media for X, but it's not, it's more than, than that. It's thinking of social media or messaging technologies as a material. Thinking about the community or the community of practice you're working with and the sort of planned permanence of that activity. Thinking about the notion of roles and what the notion of that coordination is and ways to externalize it. So, that's sort of our trajectory from sort of building funny things you put on your wrist to interact with computers, which everyone loves in the literature, to now thinking about using communications technology that everyone's using anyway, and thinking about how can we, you know, deploy it. Uh, you know, I guess from the World Fish point of view, it would be how would you deploy it as an, as an organization? And, and the difference between that WhatsApp, which is in basically uh, infrastructuring a conversation around future forecasting with 4,000 young people to 
the usual pushing things out on Facebook and what we do as organizations anyway, and universities are worse than everyone else about it, is, is quite different. And we've got, I'll just run through, there's a few things we want to talk about while we're here. It's actually the reason we came for her. And one of them is Monika's work. She's, right, she's in the early stages of a PhD. Um, and I mention this because it relates to another system I haven't talked about, another piece of work we've been doing with the uh, Red Cross's monitoring and evaluation team at the IFRC in Geneva, which is a participatory video making application that we've built in this case. And it's a methodology called Our Story. We've designed with the monitoring and evaluation team. This is actually where they're looking at, at trying to understand citizens' voices in the evaluation of programs rather than their typical monitoring and evaluation instruments. So it's actually an app which supports communities making their own films, but also a bit of a methodology. So it's a workshop structure to support people planning issues, thinking about how they're going to capture, represent them, and then they literally go off and film them themselves, tag that video, edit that video together in an app and produce the film in a, in a week activity. And Monique has just come back with some great collaboration from World Fish with the community there, having done exactly that um, uh, with, a, with a group of communities. So Monique is interested in actually using it, not in the monitoring and evaluation um, process, but actually thinking about how can we use this f in the contextualization phase of a design work, intervention development, if you like, at that er early phase but also thinking about how we use some of these unplatformed approaches to engage multi-stakeholders in that design process. So she's interested in connecting directly to policymakers, governments, INGOs, through using some of this material that's created actually by the women farmers themselves in Bangladesh that she's working with. So that's one thing. I think actually the participating video, this Our Story application might be quite interesting as yourselves as well. I'm, I mean, I, I'm not so familiar with the programs. On that note, one of the big things we find in Our Story in this participating video is translate the challenge of translation. So actually producing English subtitles or multilingual subtitles. And it's something that's developed out of more discussions we've had with the monitoring and evaluation people at IFRC, which is that translation is always treated as a bit of an afterthought in any sort of development and program or, uh, or and monitoring and evaluation program. So actually, they were very interested in thinking about translation in the field. Okay, so how do you really support translation? And it doesn't mean, you know, we pay translators without borders or just have more money for translators, but thinking about how do we do design in translation to programs and even technological applications like our story from the start, what does it mean to do that? So that is another specific thing we're interested in. And I should say also, there are also some things that are sort of, they're a bit boring for us as computer scientists, but they're actually things we've done that are quite high impact in areas such as public health, certainly in academia. So I don't know if you've heard of um, UK Biobank. It's a big biobank, half a million people, the usual thing, looking at sort of middle-aged people and lifestyle factors, how, how they relate to health. So one thing we did is built an open source physical activity monitor. So this is actually a, um, a little piece of hardware that logs uh, 100 hertz acceleration data for up to 10 days, which we actually, Buco Biobank deployed with 100,000 people. So biggest physical activity study ever conducted. And this is an open source technology we developed. We actually helped with the analysis as well and did a startup so that, uh, to distribute these sensors. There's a lot of quite big studies using these. So that's something we can do. It's not sort of super interesting for us, but it's because it's just a bit of good engineering. On the other side, something else that we did, so I led the development of that, something else that I led the development on the technical side is a system called Intake 24. So this is a dietary recall, 24-hour di multi-pass dietary re online dietary recall system. So you're probably familiar with that sort of thing. Essentially, the usual thing, trying to get better estimates of diet and nutrition. Again, it's another open source system. We originally developed it for the Food Standards Scotland. It's used in the Scottish Health Survey now. Um, it's actually going to be used in NDNS, the next version, the, the UK National Diet and Nutrition Survey. And we've done it in a few couple of other languages where collaborators have come along. So we've done it in Portuguese, um, Danish. We've got an Arabic version for some UAE collaborators that we work with. And we're very interested in thinking about, you know, can we, is it, is it interesting 
um, in other languages. I'm particularly, you know, Monique is very interested in Bangladesh context, of course. But of co we've got research, we've got capacity to deploy the system, and we know how to develop new content. Of course, when you're not eating off a plate, that's my pretty poor example of trying to make a relationship to world fish, but I don't think a bit of sort of uh, breaded haddock really helps. But you'll get the idea. You know the sort of thing. It's a multi-pass system, portion size estimation, does full nutritional analysis automatically, um, and it's been validated with doubly labeled water for energy expenditure and against interviewer-led recall. Um, so, but we are very interested in if people want to do other localizations of it, how we'd work with people to do that. So, that is a sort of thanks for listening and let's talk if there's anything you're interested in. <laughs> <laughs>